Okay, so we're looking at um, a study in Philippians, and this morning I want us to look at Philippians 2, and we're looking at verses 19 to 30, and I've entitled this, Timothy and Epaphroditus, and two vital characteristics of Christian faith, which come out of his life. So um, we're looking at uh, Philippians 2, verses 19 to 30, I will read them, they'll be up on the board, or you can up on the screen, or you can follow them in your own scriptures if you've got them. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. But everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him to you as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honour people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, immutable, unending, always true, always instructive. Holy Spirit, we invite you now to come and add life to the word, so that we become those who do the word and don't just listen to it. Amen. Just a few um, thoughts to recap on this. Um, I put this map up because I want, I want you to sense the reality of the situation. Um, the map is, is up here. You can see the distance between Rome and Philippi. It, it's a long way. And if you think what travel was like in those days, it's about 800 miles between. And it's a six month journey over treacherous ground. So just, just picture in your mind the things, you know, sometimes when we read about them sending messages and hearing about people, you think, you, we think in terms of phones and and internet and so forth, and we think of instant, we, we get instant recall, but it wasn't like that in those days. It, news took a long time to get anywhere. So just have that concept. Um, just a, a few bullet points to catch you up on, on what we've looked at so far in, in, in Philippians. Um, the Philippian church was, was roughly the same age as we are as a, as a church. Paul was in prison, he was probably in Rome, we think he was in Rome, he was under house arrest, he wasn't in a dungeon, and he had rented property, but he was actually confined to the house where he lived. Now, the church in Philippi had heard of Paul's situation, and really, they, of all the churches, had had an offering, and they'd sent it with this guy, Epaphroditus, who brought the money, and he stayed on to look after Paul and, and care for him. He obviously needed money, if he's got a rented house, he's somebody got to pay for it. So this was obviously um, a real lifesaver for Paul. Now, at this time, Epaphroditus fell ill, gravely ill, and he very nearly died. But Paul was aware of how anxious the church was concerning him. They obviously heard eventually that he was ill, and they were obviously very concerned about his well-being. Paul writes to not only say that he's getting back, better, but he feels he needs to send him from Paphroditus back to the church so they can see he's fine. <coughs> and Timothy, who's Paul's trusted lieutenant, will also come and he wants uh, to send Timothy to the church to gather news of the church, how it's getting on. Now bear in mind, what I want you to understand about this is the care that's going on, the concern for one another within the church and the churches, and Paul in particular. You read in, in 1 Thessalonians 3.8, Paul says, now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. He was so 
vitally concerned for the well-being of churches that he planted. Maybe he'll meet with him, that is Timothy again in Ephesus, if he is released. And you read in verse 24, it said that, I am confident in the Lord that I shall come soon. So Paul seemed to have a sense in his heart, whether it's prophetic, I don't know, but he seemed to sense that, you know, this wasn't the time that he was going to die, that he would be released. Um, one interesting fact, it's just an aside really, but I was interested to see this. Some authorities think, you know, um, Luke's Gospel is prefaced as in Acts by um, the writer, that is Luke, um, referring to Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus. And some people think, and I think this seems, sounds very reasonable, that Theophilus was, was a, a, like a barrister who was commissioned by the authorities to, to look into the history of Paul. Uh, of Jesus rather. Paul was going to be uh, put on trial and this barrister wanted to know well, who was this Jesus? What, what, what is all this about that Paul caused such problems in the Jewish community? So he commissioned Luke to, to write a history of Jesus and that's why we've got the Gospel of Luke. Now, it seems to be a very plausible story. Anyhow, what I want to look at then is firstly these two people, Timothy and Epaphroditus, and what they, what they show us about aspects of life that all of us should have. When we read about these well-known people, we can always think, we can almost excuse ourselves and say, well, we're not like that. They're, they're sort of, you know, they're grade one, you know, we're down in grade five somewhere, you know, they're, they're, so, they're such luminaries, we can't possibly emanate them, what they did. Well, that's not the point, really. The point is what they showed, the qualities they showed, that, that we can emulate. Firstly, there's Timothy. Now, we know of Timothy, of course, he's familiar to us. His father was a Greek, we grieve. His mother was a Jewish Christian, and he was converted to Christianity as a child. So, Paul says, in, when he writes to in Timothy, from a child, you know, the scriptures are able to make you wise to salvation. So, he's had a long history of following Jesus and he was clearly mentored by Paul and ready always to go where Paul wanted him to go, where Paul needed him. Now we know a lot about Timothy because two letters are written about him in the New Testament so it shows the importance that Paul um, placed on Timothy and how valuable he was to him in the, in the gospel ministry. And as I said earlier, he was going to be sent. Paul said, I want to send Timothy to you, so I want to gather news. I want to know how you are, so I'll send Timothy to find out what's going on. Epaphroditus um, is another character. We don't know an awful lot about him. Um, he was probably a, a spiritual leader in Philippi. Um, Paul refers to him, if you remember in that passage we read, as my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldiers, so he was obviously another valuable, uh, a valuable man to Paul in the cause of the gospel. And he come to minister to Paul and then he himself fell ill. It's very interesting, just again, we, we can't, we haven't time to dwell on this one now, but um, you know, we, we read about Paul at one stage that wherever he went, even, even if the, the, the shadow fell upon somebody, they were healed. Um, and he said, well, if Epaphras fell well, why didn't Paul heal him? <laughs> um, and I can't answer that question. All I can say is God is sovereign and there are times when he heals and times when he doesn't. And we have to live with that and understand it. We don't understand it. It's a mystery that we have to live with the mystery why God heals some and not others. In one sense, God did heal Epaphras, but Paul says that he was, he was ill. He almost died, but God had mercy on him. And he lived. So you could say, well, in a sense that was healing, but it wasn't the instant healing we see in some people, like the blind man who sees immediately, or the, the, the man who was lying on a, a bed who got up and walked. But anyhow, whatever the truth in that, whatever the reality, Paul is now, Epaphroditus' father is now better, and uh, Paul wants to send him back to the church. Now, in the midst of this care and what's going on, and Paul's expressed concern for the church, 
There's this verse which is really quite a challenge to me, verse 21, where Paul says, everyone looks out for their own interests, not that of Jesus Christ. And for anybody who wants to work in church, wants to be in a church, that a live church that's living and, and expressing the gospel and seeking to reach out into the world, a church of Christ, to be a New Testament pattern, this is, this is a challenge, isn't it? Because when the chips are down, we tend to, to sort of withdraw and look after our own interests rather than the interests of Jesus Christ. And it's a challenge to every one of us. Um, how, we, how we react to things. Is, is Christ so central to us that we look on his work as being the prime thing in our life and it takes pride of place in how we think, how we pray, how we live. i just leave that one with you. Not to put you under condemnation, but say it's a challenge to us whether we put Christ first in our attitude to what's happening in the church, where we're going, how we relate to one another, how we, how we build the church. A very important factor. Let's put Christ first. So these two men, Epaphroditus and Timothy, had been discipled by Paul and he, he invested in them. He gave so much of himself about his own understanding of Christ to them so that they were, they were built up. They were men of stature. They were men of usefulness in the kingdom of God. And a lot of it, obviously it's the Holy Spirit, it's obviously God working in that, that's, that's totally true, but God often ministers to other people. And they were who they were, largely through the investment that Paul had made in them. And when I was thinking about it, I was, I was thinking, of, you know, over the years the church has been going, and how Rob has invested in people, how he's discipled people. I think of Jordan, who was with us for a while, and now is an elder down at, down at Lancaster and, and doing a great job. I think of Josh Bonnet, who he was a boy who, as a lad, went into drugs and went all, right off the rails, and then he came back to God, and he was with us for a time, and, and Rob sort of discipled him, and he grew, and now he's planting a church with his wife out in Gothenburg in Sweden. You know, and you look at the history, you think the, the investment that is made to build people, it's so important. Even Ed here, <laughs> he's been discipled by Rob. Yeah, even Ed. <laughs> would testify, I'm sure, to the same way, that the, that investment of time and of the, you know, when, when you've heard of God, to be able to share it with other people and, and, and sort of infect them with, with what you've received and what God has done, it's, it's part of the way God builds his church, builds leaders, builds stamina and, and help in the church. So that's fine, that's all very well, and you say, well, that's all right, but I don't think, I don't line myself up with Timothy. I can't really put a light to Epaphroditus. I'm just me. So I want to look at the, what, what lies behind, and there are two, I mean, there may be many more things here, but there are two things in particular that I feel epitomize who they are, which should characterize each of us. One is obedience, and the other is caring. Okay, just two things, obedience and caring. And I say this because um, and my sort of umbrella verse for this thought is what Paul says in Thessalonians 5.23 when he says, talking to the Thessalonian church, he says, May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're bodies, we're minds, we're heart, but we're also soul or spirit, depending on how you view soul and spirit or soul. And to, I don't mind whether you think that they're separate or together. The thing is, we have... A body which is temporal, which will grow old and die, but we have a soul which is eternal. And what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, may your whole, the wholeness of you be preserved to Christ. And so what we're looking at is not the, the well-being merely of our bodies, we want to keep healthy, but we're looking for health, healthy souls. That eternal part of us which grows in the knowledge of God and, and becomes like Jesus. And it's going to last for eternity. You, know, you are going to last for eternity. You have an eternal destiny with Christ. And we start now, and we will never stop, knowing Jesus, growing more like him. That's what we call sanctification. So that is, that is the, 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 the background which I want to look at these two things, obedience and caring. Now, you can look at obedience in, in various ways. If I'm... If I'm in the army, as I was once, and, and I've got a, a squad of soldiers on the parade ground, I, 
I call out orders and I expect them to be obeyed immediately or other consequences. You look for immediate obedience. You, cut, you have a command and that's it. You, you say turn left and they turn left. You say halt and they halt. Um, and so forth. So there is a sense, that sense of obedience which has to be obeyed immediately. Now obedience is, is here in scripture. We're told, for instance, in Romans 13 to obey civil authorities. Christians are to be good citizens. We're to obey the law of the land. Paul even says in Hebrews 13, he says, obey those in authority over you. So he says, you know, Graham and Ed and I look at this and we say, oh dear, have we, have we got to be obeyed? Well, there is a spiritual sense in which leadership does require, in the spirit in Christ, um, obedience. That, that, that is part of the way the church, church goes forward at the end. But I'm not... I'm not talking about either of those things in this when I talk about obedience. What I'm looking at in both Timothy and Epaphroditus is something, something different. When Paul was before Agrippa, um, when he was giving an account of how he became a Christian, he told him how he met with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now, that's a, a litotis, if you like. It's, it's a double negative. I was not disobedient. He was, he was very obedient. Um, in fact, his whole life became centered around Christ and about obeying him, about doing what he wanted, not out of a sense of serviceness, but out of a sense of love. I was devoted to Christ. He said, I, I, I'm a bond slave to Christ and I wanted to obey him. And it's, it's that sort of obedience to Christ that I'm looking at here, that epitomise both Timothy and Epaphroditus' ministry and helpfulness in the church. Matthew 11.28, there's a verse which I've been thinking about a lot recently, and it, it's, it, it's, it's just wonderful, I'm sure you know it so well. Come to me, all that you of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my burden is light, my yoke is easy. So obedience to Christ is, 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 is not sergeant, the, the sergeant major on the parade ground. It's, it's a loving Christ who, who says, look, I'm lowly in heart, come to me, I'm, I will pay your burdens. It's, it's difficult to think why we want, wouldn't want to obey a Christ like that, isn't it, when we think of it? So, what I'm saying is that our lives should be one of obedience to, to Jesus. Um, learn to listen to the still, small voice. I'm trying to think of ways in which it needs. It's a lovely... We all, I thought, accept the principle, yes, we, we want to obey Christ. What does that mean in reality? Well, it's, it's finding out what Christ wants in our lives, both corporately and as an individuals. How do we know that? Well, it's, you know, that, that picture of Elijah, you know, in the cave, and the, 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 the lightning comes, and the earthquake comes, and everything, and God is not in that. And then there's, there's the still, small voice. And it's, it's that, that voice of Jesus we want to How do we hear it? Well, I suggest we hear Jesus in, in reading scripture, in what we might call our quiet time, or however you do it daily. You, you, through scripture, you want to hear, hear Christ. Make the book live to me, O Lord, was, was one of the uh, choruses we used to sing when we were young. Um, hearing Christ in the Bible reading, when, when we pray, it's not just a one-way thing. We pray to Jesus. We pray to the Father through Jesus, perhaps, in that way. But we want to listen to him. It's not just a thing to bring our request to Jesus. We want to hear from him so that we know what he's saying to us. Um, it's, it's the spiritual gifts. Now, we, we've already heard from, from Jesus, I believe, this morning in, 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 a, in a tongue. Um, Sue brought us a prophetic word, a lovely prophetic word, where God was just sharing with us something of his heart for us. He says, don't, don't be afraid to come to me. Now, this is, this is God speaking to us so clearly. How is it that we sometimes don't give it the preeminence that we should? 
and we don't listen as carefully as we should. These spiritual gifts of words of knowledge and prophecy. And it's really good to, to cultivate a way in which we hear for one another, too. This is another one of another. Is we, we care for one another. And we, we want to obedient to Jesus. If Jesus gives you a word for somebody, don't be afraid to, to bring it. Leave the consequences with him, but uh, to bring it when it's from Jesus. So there's this sense of obedience. Now, I believe that was, that was true of Timothy. It was true of Aphroditus, the other leaders in the church. And it should be, to, a, to in a measure, true of all of us, that we have that obedience to Jesus so that we hear him and we become useful to him because we then become living letters to be seen and read all men. The other thing is, is caring. Um, I, when I thought of this, um, we went to see Raymond on, on Friday, Jenny and I, and we went into the Kendall Care Home, and I was just struck again by the amazing ministry of, of carers been so struck, haven't we, over the last couple of years by, you know, all through this pandemic, we've been aware of the amazing sacrifice. I mean, we've been hearing, remember those times when we were out at six o'clock in the evening clapping the National Health Service? Why did we do that? Well, we were just overwhelmed by the care that medics were giving, very often at the cost, in some cases, of their own lives to look after people. And that sense of caring is amazing, wonderful. And uh, we do that. Um, but in a sense, that caring is, is a sign of, of the God's goodness to mankind. There were people who were caring in that sense, who were of all faiths, some of no faith. But they still had that wonderful gift of caring. And that is God's supreme gift. We call it common grace. What I want to talk about is, is something slightly different from that. Much as I love it and applaud it and I'm thankful to God for it. The caring I'm looking at, um, again, looking at 1 Peter 5, 7, where Peter says, cast all your anxiety on him because he, he cares for you. He cares for you. I don't know how you've responded so far to what's happened in worship, but what, what I found, in, in particularly in, in, in Sue's prophetic work, was the, the sense that God cares for us. He, he really loves it. He cares for you. Do, you. do you sense that right now? Do you sense God cares for me? He's got me in the hollow of his hand and he, he loves me. He cares for me. Jesus said in Matthew 5.30, you know, he said, you know, look at the, look at the, 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 the lilies of the field. You know, they don't toil or spin, he said, but God cares for them. And he said, how much more will he clothe you? So what does that mean in practice? Um, well, I, I suggest to you that, that each of us has friends, each of us has those that we respect and trust in the Lord, whom we can be open and we can speak into our, their lives, and they can speak into our lives. Do you have somebody who you trust, who can really talk and speak into your life? It's, it's so helpful to do that. We can have friendships, and they can be at various levels. Sometimes it's fairly superficial, sometimes it's at quite a deep level, that friendship. But friendships are important when they can, we can really speak into people's lives and they can receive it and likewise with us. You need to be able to trust one another for that. Um, Paul says in Galatians 6.1, if somebody is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore such a one, watching yourself, lest you also be tempted. And I would suggest that there are Three things in this that we need to remember. Encouraging, exhorting, and empathizing. Three things that we, we, we need to do to one another to help each other. And that may be that that caring is, is on a personal basis, that we do have somebody we can really talk to. And we would accept they talk into our lives. We need it. We need that safeguard. None of us is safe. We can all fall from grace in all sorts of ways. Um, and uh, yes, we need that somebody who can talk to our lives. So obedience and caring, I suggest, are things we need to recognize and cultivate. Nothing in the Christian life, I think, um, is, is absolved from that sense of nurturing and caring. Things that don't happen. We need to work at it 
as the Holy Spirit works us, work out your own salvation because God is working in you, that twofold thing that's happening. They care for one another. It's, it's, it's seen when somebody's ill, we've got a group of people who give meals to people, that's caring, that's looking at a need and saying, yes, I love you, I, I want to help you. That's wonderful, it's so much appreciated. Praying for one another, concern for spiritual welfare. We need to be on the lookout for one another, not just in our physical needs, but in our spiritual and emotional needs as well. Let me, as I come to a close, I just wanted to, to refer to another passage in, in Philippians, that's chapter four, verses two and three, where Paul talks about Euodia and Syntyche, who are having a spat. <laughs> it's clearly a, quite a spiritual um, problem and a disagreement. It must have been serious because it's in scripture. And Paul thinks, I feel a bit sorry for them that all through the centuries they've been labelled as people who had a disagreement. What a shame to be remembered to that. Um, but nevertheless, let's think about it. a serious spiritual disagreement there. I and mean, they were probably wonderful people. There were some wonderful women in the early church. It was Lydia who was really instrumental in, in, in starting the church in Philippi, that seller of purple whom they met at the time of prayer, the foundation of the church. Um, but you see, Paul, Paul is concerned about this. He's aware that it's happening and it's having a bad effect on the church. You know, sometimes if you have a bad disagreement in the church, you begin to take sides. People say they want people on their side, so they talk about it. And the other person they're having a spat with, think, well, I want people on my side. So you begin to get polarizing people on one side or the other, which is a disaster. It's awful. So Paul is quite wisely saying he wants to invoke a true yoke fellow. And sometimes in your versions, you'll feel it, he's called Sisygus. And some people used to think that was an individual person, but he's, he's obviously has somebody in mind. That word means true yoke fellow. So he's looking for somebody, as I've been talking about, somebody you can trust, who can come and mediate, who can say, take them aside and say, look, let's, let's sort this. Let's hear both sides of this disagreement and see if we can find common ground, get it sorted. That's wonderful. Now, that's an illustration of caring. That really is how it cares. Instead of something blowing up which can, can, can potentially destroy a church, you handle it in the right way and you do it as Paul does. Um, but um, what I wanted to say, and I, my time is gone, and I, I just wanted to thought this most important for us, it doesn't mean to say that all disagreement is wrong. We're not just yes people who just sort of sit there and calmly take everything and don't, if, if something's happening we really deeply disagree with, we can say, oh, Disagreement is not wrong if it's handled in the right way. And I, I wanted to say particularly to those of you who are students at Cape and they have got a time to, to study the word, there will be things that you hear that you disagree with or you think you doubt. Don't be afraid of that. Disagree, talk to one another, have a good argument about it. Sort yourself, be, you know, Paul says, let everybody be fully persuaded in his own mind. It's really important to take this opportunity to, to become fully persuaded. And don't be afraid of, of disagreement and all sorts of issues which Christians disagree about. So be persuaded and to sort them perhaps in your own mind and think about them. Very important. And uh, the last thing is let this mind be in you. Paul said, and there's a verse, um, the contemporary version is lovely, it says, think the same way as Jesus thought. That really summarizes everything I've been saying. Think the same way as Jesus thought. Um, Ed mentioned that we were on the, um, the, the leaders prayer meeting at Christ Central and it was so inspiring and I looked at that group of guys there and, and, and ladies, women there who, who were worshipping, we were praying, we were hearing ministry and so forth and I, I just felt how glad I am to be in a group of churches, in a group of people who are so caring for one another not only obedient to scripture, but also caring for one another. Now, I'm sure other groups have the same. I'm not saying that Christ Center is unique in that, but what I'm saying is it is a privilege to be part of something where you feel, you know, they care for me. If, if I go off the rails, if the church is in difficulties, there are people who care who are gonna come in and say, look, we care for you, we want to help you, we want to speak into your lives, we want to help you. 
And the final verse is one. What is the importance of this? And that is summarized by what Peter says in his first letter. He says, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. This isn't just Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus. They're the leaders and here's the church. And they're important and they say and you do. It's saying that we're all in this together. Leadership doesn't delineate us in a, term, in a, in a structure, a hierarchical structure. He calls us to various things. Some of us are elders, some of us are heads of departments or deacons in the church, um, leading small groups. We're not delineated in that sense, it's just a, just a task we do. And that goes right through the church, right through to Jeremy and, and others in, in, in um, Christ Central. We're, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, says Peter, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that is an amazing statement. Lord, we just for a moment dwell on those words. Who we are. We're a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people belonging to God. That we may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness in his marvelous light. Lord, make us people of light. Make us people, Lord, who obey you. Make us people who care, care for others, care for you as you care for us. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to bring this alive in our experience. In Jesus' name, amen.